morning. Amen. And indeed, Jack, it is a privilege to have you back with us, brother. Uh, you know, the piano I play has about 88 keys on it, but I think you bring a whole bunch more with you, you know. I, uh, <clears throat> I have noticed that. Uh, always a delight. Our scripture this morning is Luke, the 10th chapter, and we'll begin reading with the 38th verse, Luke 10, 38 through 42. Now it happened as they went, he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. <clears throat> but Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> The gospel reading in the lectionary this week for today is Luke 10, 38 through 42. And throughout the world today, the church is studying a brief moment in the life of Jesus. It is what some would describe as a passing moment. As scripture reads, and it came to pass as they continued their travels or as they traveled along, even the writer seems to play down the moment. He doesn't mention the name of the village. He just says a certain village. He doesn't tell us why Jesus was there. He doesn't even mention Lazarus unless this is a different Mary and Martha, which is highly doubtful. He doesn't mention their brother, Lazarus. The other gospel writers did not even mention this moment. Either they had too much other material and they did not consider this event worthy enough to mention, or this was so seemingly insignificant a moment that they didn't bother to put it in their gospel story. Just a passing moment. You know, in music composition, notes that appear individually and connect chords, like Jack, you have a lot of them, are themselves called passing tones because they're connecting one chord to another. And they would appear insignificant from a th theory standpoint, but they are essential to the beauty of the peace as because they provide movement and resolution to the peace. In the same way, our lives are often filled with passing moments, aren't they? Just passing through. You know, my life as a preacher, for instance, I have long periods of study, long periods of preparation for an event that may take me only 15 minutes to 30 minutes. I heard somebody say, yeah, right, preacher. 
But uh, whether it's a teaching or a sermon or a message for a special occasion, a, a patriotic talk or leading a group meeting as a moderator or facilitator, and then maybe later reflecting on the event and how the work could have been improved and made more effective, it's a passing moment. Not just passing time. Have you ever heard somebody say, oh, we're just passing time. Uh, I like what is in Gone with the Wind where it says, don't squander time. That's the stuff life is made out of. So passing, most of life is filled with passing moments. Maybe that's why we say we're just passing through life. And when we're done, we're said to have passed away. You know, though it is not mentioned by Matthew, Mark, and John, apparently this story was part of the oral tradition of the early church and was being shared in the church in Antioch where Luke was. And he must have heard this story, possibly heard it from Peter, because we know Peter was there at Antioch at one time. He may have heard it from Philip. He may have heard it from Mark, John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. He may have even heard it from James. He may have confirmed it with all of these, so that it was more than just some kind of apocryphal story, but that it literally was a moment in the life of Christ even though the other gospel writers did not even mention it, Luke was so strangely touched by it that he wanted to share it with us. And I'm so glad he did. Maybe also because Luke was not an eyewitness, he presents the account in a general or generic fashion, wishing to maintain the integrity of the story as it was given to him by not naming the place, nor even mentioning Lazarus, just by simply saying it was a certain village and a certain woman named Martha. So let's not get distracted by all the unknowns of this passage. Rather, let us do like Mary and listen to Jesus. I believe if we do, we will hear why Luke was so moved to give us this story. The best way I know to accomplish this is to do a simple homiletical verse-by-verse -verse exploration of Luke's narrative. And we can do that in the scriptures. We read in verse 38 that Martha had invited Jesus into her home. And uh, the story says it was a certain village, and a real person by the name of Martha. You know, that uh, certain implied a real person. So that's why this word was used in the original language, so that they would know that this is more than just a parable, that this was a real moment in the life of Christ, and uh, Martha had received Jesus. And that word there means to receive as a guest. She had received him into her home as a guest. Now, Martha apparently would have been a very prominent member of the village. Or at least she would have been better known than Mary. Because it is not Mary and Martha. It is Martha and Mary. She is mentioned first. And it is her home in which Jesus is invited to be a guest. In verse 39, it says she had a sister called Mary, who sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Now, normally this would have been a, a good thing because this personal affection and attention shown to a guest would have allowed Martha to go about the other task in the home to make sure that all of Jesus' needs were met. And uh, so you wonder why Martha saw this as such a negative thing. 
However, we shall see that Martha interpreted Mary's actions in a negative way. When she could have seen her sister's actions as very important and very positive toward welcoming the guest. But Martha, the scripture says in verse 40, was encumbered with much serving. That Greek word there means to be drawn to many things. In other words, she was running back and forth trying to make sure that the, the soup didn't get cold and the bread didn't burn and trying to make sure that the things that were supposed to be served cold were served cold, the things supposed to be served hot were served hot and, and that all the uh, utensils were in place and that everything was just right. You know, I can kind of picture Martha running a kitchen staff of servants normally and probably this day, they all had the day off, and Martha had forgot about that when she invited Jesus over. And then she also had probably forgotten that Jesus also had 12 disciples that would come with him. And, uh, you know, there is Mary, just sitting while she is busy serving and doing more than just serving. She's busy sweating. Because you don't work in a kitchen without perspiring, right? I mean, you just get worked up. And uh, she's scurrying about the kitchen. And while Martha is scurrying, there's her precious sister just sitting. Sitting at Jesus' feet. And, you know, she couldn't cook and serve it all at the same time. She needed help. Mary could help her if she really wanted to. I wonder if maybe Martha didn't think in the whole process, I don't know if I would have invited Jesus and his disciples over if I knew Mary wasn't going to be any help. Maybe Jesus could help Mary see the need. You know, she might not listen to her, but she certainly would listen to Jesus. And he could obviously see that she needed help. All it would take probably would be a rebuke from Jesus for Mary to come to her senses. And she decided that she would bring the matter to Jesus' attention. So Martha approached Jesus very respectfully. She called him Lord. We know that it was very respectfully because she said, Lord. And then she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? And fully expecting him to say, oh, of course I care, Mary. I mean, Martha, I'm so sorry. I'll make sure that Mary gets right on it. And finally, she just gets to the point. She says, tell her to help me. I need help. You know, Martha was a doer, wasn't she? She was a doer and a decider, possibly speaking before considering the answer, because she is telling Jesus, I, you know, basically, I know, Lord, that you care that I'm doing this all by myself. So just, you know, intervene. Just tell Mary to help me. I imagine if Martha had a t-shirt, it would probably read, don't ask me if you really don't care to know what I think. Or maybe she would have had a t-shirt that said, plain spoken Martha, or ready to give you a piece of my mind. Have you ever run into anybody like that? You know, the problem with giving people a piece of your mind all the time is after a while you have nothing left to give. Now, Martha, verse 41 says, was probably very shocked. It doesn't say it in the text, but I think one would be amazed if after reading this you didn't draw that conclusion. Martha was probably very shocked, surprised, and disappointed by Jesus' response to her request. He called her name twice. 
Martha, Martha. I know I passed at a church one time where there was a lady there, Martha, Martha. And she liked to joke about that and say, Martha, Martha. You know, actually what Jesus was doing by repeating her name was he was letting her know that he was now focusing his attention on her. You see, maybe if you read beneath the lines here, you may see that there's more than just anger here about Mary not doing her share of the serving. Martha's probably thinking while she's wiping away the sweat. And each time she goes back in to see Jesus to bring something to set before him, and Mary is sitting there in rapt attention going, oh, we just put it here. Back to Jesus. It's my house. I invited Jesus. I prepared the meal. I'm going and doing all the serving. Do you see a little jealousy here? And this is why I believe Jesus focused on Martha and called her name twice. Because he wanted her to know, Martha, you're right. I'm going to focus on you right now. <laughs> Martha, Martha. And she may have been complaining the whole time she was working. You know, the bread's going to get burned, the soup is going to get cold, the table's not set. And Jesus said to her, Martha, Martha, you are troubled, are anxious about many things. And that word there means a tumult or an uproar. You just made yourself in a, put yourself in a dither. Have you ever heard that expression, you know? An old southern expression about just harried almost. But you are disturbed and upset about many things. And the word that he adds to that is a word troubled. And that word is, hold on to your hats, an apoxylogomena. You have heard me use that term probably one time before. It is a word that means that word only appears one time in the work. If it appeared only one time, whether it is a novel or, in this case, the Bible, which makes for a challenge in translation because often words are translated based upon their usage in other places. And if you never see them in another place, it's kind of hard to translate it, so you have to go to the Greek classical writers in some of their works to try to understand what that word meant. So Martha, Martha, you are troubled. You are vexed. You're in an uproar about all these many things. And it meant to you're drawn to all these many different tasks. And if you know that you're going to be a good host, there's just more than meeting the guest at the door and telling them to have a comfortable seat, isn't there? There's a lot involved. But Jesus said to her, but one thing you've missed and need. And I'm sure Martha must have thought, are you telling me, Lord, I'm the one who needs and not Mary? Mary needs to get off her duff and come help me in the kitchen. And you're telling me, no, you need. Because you see, she has chosen the good thing, and it will be never taken from her. Well, what is that one thing? That if you miss it, all the other things that you do can't compensate for the loss. But on the other hand, if you do it 
and miss all the other things, this one thing will compensate for everything else. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 27, 4, one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire of the Lord. Isn't that kind of what Mary was doing? She was beholding the beauty of the Lord. She was sitting before him. Perhaps she may have even asked him a few questions. But mainly, she was listening. Jesus said, you still lack one thing in Luke 18.22. Come and follow me. Paul wrote, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. One thing. G. Campbell Morgan wrote, If we would be strong for service in the strength that prevents distraction and unrest, we must know what it is to find time amid all the duties of life to sit at his feet as disciples. Spurgeon wrote, The way to get to revival is to begin at the Master's feet. You must go there with Mary, and afterwards you can work with Martha serving Christ. A few takeaways from these moments. Martha and Mary are two different people living in one house. Martha is complicated, maybe a deep thinker. She's definitely a solution seeker and a problem solver. Mary is much less complicated. She might even could be called simple, but her simplicity was enduring. Have you ever met a sweet and gentle spirit like that? You know, no, they were not rocket scientists, but they had a sweet smile on their face, a sweet disposition, and, and an eagerness to learn. That was Mary. Mary is much less complicated than Martha. Martha was a concrete, mechanical, task-oriented, everything black and white, less touchy-feely. We had a member of a church I pastored one time that she wasn't a hugger. She'd just go, huggy, huggy. Martha was concrete, mechanical, task-oriented. Mary was abstract, possibly artistic. Whereas Martha was everything as black and white, Mary was more gray areas, more of on the other hand than Martha, and probably was a hugger. Martha was ready to help you see her point. Mary was ready to listen and see yours. Now, with all of these points that we've made, let us not miss the point of the story. Both sisters had different personalities. Neither was superior to the other. They were just different. You know, in our task-driven world, Martha might be the most respected and best employee and eventually a manager. But Mary, on the other hand, might make the best teacher or counselor. Both wanted to share and connect with Jesus. Martha wanted to display what she had. That's part of entertaining, let's be honest. You know, when you bring friends into your home, you want to give them a, a good welcome. You want to make them feel a part of, of what you have been blessed with. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that to entertain people. We're supposed to entertain. In fact, hospitality is to be a ministry of the Christian to offer hospitality to people. 
Mary, on the other hand, wanted to know what her guest was and had to offer to the relationship. She wanted to welcome Jesus into the home. You know, there are so many sheer congestures one can make about these two sisters that uh, one could meditate on this moment and come away with numerous thoughts. Perhaps this attracted Luke to the story. It was maybe this that made Luke want to include it in his gospel, that you come away after hearing this story with all of these thoughts buzzing in your head. Maybe these lessons to be learned that Luke saw. So let's not miss the main point here. Okay, preacher, I'm finally glad you're going to get around to it. What is the main point? I believe it's simply this. You can mess up in a lot of ways in your life. Even trying to do good things for Jesus. But you can never mess up sitting at the feet of Jesus. When you sit there with open ears to hear, open mind to learn, and an open heart to receive and obey our Lord's commands. Because you see, when you do that, what you will receive from these moments will become a part of who you are. And thus, it can never be taken from you. And you can never lose it. In John 11, 5, we are told that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. <clears throat> you know, Jesus loves all Marys and Marthas of this world of both sexes. And we'll also... We will also, if Christ's love is in our hearts through the gift of his presence and the Holy Spirit. John 12, 2 says that there was a picture of the family in John 12, 2. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. There is Martha, still serving. And there is Lazarus, the resurrected brother of Mary and Martha, but this is the temporarily resurrected brother because he's going to die again. This is not his final resurrection, but he, is, he was brought back from the dead by the word of Christ, and he's sitting at the table, and there is Mary still at the feet of Jesus, but as the natural consequence of getting to know Jesus better loves him even more. To know him is to love him, and to love him is to adore and praise him. Let us sit at the feet of Jesus by reading his word and listening for his voice in it and accepting the guidance of the precious Holy Spirit as he allows us to hear 